So hello everybody, this is the, the clinical uh, update uh, by Anne, uh, Anne de Geest. I am Anne de Geest and today we have a lot to talk about. Uh, I encourage you to look at my first video that's going into the spread of the virus across the world, uh, the US and California. And so what we'll talk about on the clinical side uh, is that there are some concerns about brain long-term effects of the disease, even with people who have had mild to medium cases. We do a quick update on vaccine and therapeutics, um, and we have some interesting data on reopening and how this may restructure some industries. So again, I'd like to kind of get everybody into the same, the same mindset. If you look at the progression of the disease, uh, around 30 to 50% uh, are asymptomatic. Dr. Foshi just testified that again today, and the World Health Organization just came out yesterday saying it's around 50%. And that's the problem of the disease. A lot of people are spreading the disease, not being aware of it. Around 80%. We think they're recovering, but we're discovering they may not. So we'll talk more about that. 20% would end up in the hospitals there. Um, and out of that 20%, roughly a third will end up on a ventilator with a very high mortality rate. And the other two thirds will end up in oxygen treatment there, but still pretty high mortality rate of 10 to 30%. And then, um, so if, if we go back, just to make sure is that when you get exposed, the, the time where you're the most contagious is before you have any symptoms. By the time you get symptoms, it can take between two to 14 days. On the average, it's two to five days. And that's where you have that viral load that you can measure and gets weaker and weaker as it goes. And then the body has its own response. And that's what we call the inflammatory response. You may have heard about the cytokine response, the cytokine storm. And that's the one that's creating all the complication that will end up getting you into the hospital. So what we're looking for for symptoms is the loss of smell is the most determinant factor for this disease. It happens before you have a temperature or any of these symptoms. So if you start losing your sense of smell in probably between 50 to 66% of the cases, it is the first symptoms you get. It's, it's unique to this disease. Uh, and then a lot of people get, some people get fever and a dry cough and headaches. The big area you need to worry, if you ever get that positive, you need to get yourself a pulse oximeter because, and we'll talk a bit more about that, is that when you get hypoxic, this is when you start doing damage into your body and you have that, that uh, uh, inflammatory response and cytokine response. When you end up in hospitals, we'll talk more about that, you end up with all this very serious complication there. So how the virus attack the cell? Uh, this is an electron microscope of the virus in yellow attacking the cells. There is this famous spike that gets into the ACE2 receptor. And what we discover is that this virus, the COVID-19, has a 10 times higher binding affinity than its cousin, which was the SARS, you know, that came out in around 2002. And when it gets inside the cells, it duplicates itself. And then it comes out again and goes invade other people there. So it, it is a very aggressive uh, uh, disease, we first thought that it was just affecting the lungs. This is what happened in the ER. We thought it was just a lung problem. What we have learned and what we know so far is that we don't really have a drug that fixed this. There is no cure for this disease uh, at this stage. What does work is social distancing and hand washing and masks. That's the only thing that works we know for sure. Children have a lower sickness risk by roughly 50%. So if they get exposed to the same viral load than an adult, half of them will get sicker than an adult. But when they do get sick, 70% of them will become asymptomatic. So they may be carrying the disease, being contagious, having so much amount of symptoms that they don't really realize, but they could spread the disease. What we know on the adult is around day seven to 10, it's a very important window. This is when you win the war uh, and, you, and your uh, immune system is under control or you lose the control of your immune system there. And then you end up with a cytokine storm and you require hospitalization really, really fast. Um, we now have more and more data showing that indoor transmission is the big problem, much more than outdoor. Uh, and if you want more details, you know, we talked about this in prior videos. Uh, we know the virus has mutated from Germany and it's five times more contagious because it has five times more spikes. So, and, and we know that it's not really the age that determines mortality, it's the fact you have a lot of pre-existing condition. So if you're a 40 years old that's diabetic, has had a stroke or cardiac problems or hypertension, uh, and is obese, you are probably at a higher risk than a 70 year old who is in good shape. So don't assume that age is protective. We also, and we'll sp speak more about that, are discovering that the majority of the transmission are coming from maybe 10% of events, 
like an indoor rally or a sports event or going to a bar. And there are some super spreaders who have not fully identified who they are, but it's perceived that in a Georgia study that 2% of people are responsible for 20% of the contagion. What we don't know yet is when are we going to get a vaccine, and probably won't get one, but a mix of vaccine and how effective they're going to be. Uh, there's a lot of expectation it's going to be a second wave hitting the U.S. next winter. And we don't know about the long-term uh, consequences of this, of, this, uh, of this disease, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And we don't know how long the antibody lasts, and I'll talk more about that. So it is a disease that's a train wreck on all your inside organ. This is not a flu. This is a disease of attack and damage your body. Um, and one of the things that's a key characteristic of this disease is, is a, what's called silent hypoxia. The way the body works is that you breathe because your level of CO2 coming out of your lungs is not extracted correctly there and goes up. And that's what gets the brain to, take, to get you to take a breath. Uh, for most people, what happens is that the O2 saturation drops, but the CO2 is still working normally there. And they walk up in the emergency room with very, very low level of oxygen in their tissue, which means they're damaging their tissue there. So uh, you have to detect silent hypoxia, and you know you need to get a pulse oximeter at home. And if you're positive, you need to test yourself, you know, every day. If you end up dropping below 91% at sea level, you absolutely need to uh, uh, ask for medical attention. Uh, we know that the virus is attacking the blood, and it's attacking the endothelial cells that's inside uh, the vessels. And that's important there because when you have a blood clot, it can lead to strokes, to heart attack and to problem with kidneys. And so we are discovering also that people are having brain long-term consequences. And this has come up in the last week. Even people who had mild COVID who were staying at home and they thought they were fine and they recovered. And what they're discovering is that unrelated to the severity of COVID, and I emphasize that, so unrelated if you were mild to severe, people are showing these long-term problems there where they have a brain inflammation that can lead to very strange behavior like delirium and hallucination. They could have a blood clot like this person had here that gives you a stroke, which has long-term damage. They have peripheral neurological dis disorders, which is similar to the Guillain-Barre uh, disease. And this can happen between 6 to 27 days after onset of COVID. So these are not for people that are recovering from being on a ventilator. This could happen to anybody, including the mild cases. This is a, a, a graphic that goes into more detail, but you can see that a lot of these uh, diseases there, some people recover. You know, you have a complete recovery of some of this inflammation response, but in other cases, they didn't recover. So if, you're, if you have a stroke and if you have some of these peripheral diseases there, you, know, you don't necessarily recover. So it's something you need to be aware that even if you have mild a disease to keep an eye on any symptoms that are neurological and get treated immediately. Uh, in Italy, um, there was another study that just came out that again shows persistent symptom after an acute COVID. In their case, they follow people who had been discharged from the hospital. And what they find out is 71% had symptoms 60 days after they got discharged. And, uh, and, and so, uh, and it was, you know, people were on ventilators and non ventilators, you know, and the type of symptoms they had were persistent symptoms. It's not that you just feel bad and then you get better. It's fatigue, uh, problem breathing, uh, joint pain, and chest pain. And this is to give you an idea of the type, the wrinkle the disease, you have a lot of these symptoms. But what they're discovering is that a lot of these diseases after you test negative are long lasting. So uh, not to scare everybody there, but these are picture of lungs. This is healthy lungs. This is unfortunately a, a, a autopsy of a COVID patient there. And, and there's permanent damage to some patients, not all, but some patients there in their lungs. People have acute kidney failure, which unfortunately leads you to dialysis there. So, uh, so please, 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 you know, don't get yourself exposed if you can avoid it. Uh, a graphic we showed last time, but I think it's important to get this message over and over again. Young people, which is the yellow bar, if they have hypertension, obesity, chronic disease, and diabetes, are at risk. This is not a disease of the age. This is a disease of pre-existing condition. Around 90% of the deaths are linked to pre-existing condition. And that's the problem because the US, 41% of the US has some type of pre-existing condition. 
risk. This is a graphic that just came out from New England Journal of Medicine that shows what's called the odds ratio. The odds ratio is that one is the average. So if you have a two ratio, that means you're twice as risky. So clearly being older, increase the odds by two X. Being female, decrease your chance. More, more men will talk more about it than female uh, have uh, severity. But everything related to hypertension and cardiovascular is a driver of the more severe cases. Male hormone may help the coronavirus infiltrate the human cells. This is something that came out this week. And what it shows is that in Italy, for example, 82% of the people in the ICU were men. And they are starting to discover that androgens, which is the category that uh, include all the male hormones, including testosterone, help the SARS to connect and infiltrate the human cells. Um, and, and somehow it's doing that by helping the ACE2 receptors to accept the virus. It's also an issue there with blood clots. And we also know, for example, that bold men, and bold men is linked to testosterone. So I don't know if you know, gentlemen, but if you're bold, that means you have most testosterone. And so we're discovering that people who are bold also have a significantly higher risk to be hospitalized. So there's clearly something going on with the male hormones that increase the severity uh, uh, of the disease and, and the bad outcome. And also we discovered that prostate patients, which are also linked to testosterone level, have more severe reaction to COVID. Another explanation of this is to say, well, maybe it's not because of the hormones, but it's because most of the men have more pre-existing conditions. So all this data is coming out and we have to sort this out. We talk about this in the past, but I want to remind people there because now that has been validated by multiple studies that uh, people with type A blood have a 1.5 higher risk than people with type O blood. And that's just because the way the virus works on the red blood cells. We're starting to learn more and more that there's a certain type of mutation that puts you at high risk. And that may be a good news because now we can identify people who are at high risk. A study came out uh, from Spain. And this is very important there because the assumption we have with the vaccine and the herd immunity is that you develop antibody and the antibody will protect you from being re-exposed and being reinfected. What we are learning from a study in Spain, and remember Spain was like Italy, they got hit really, really hard uh, by the virus. They did a study of 26,000 households. That's a very big study there. What they find out is that you had a higher amount of antibodies in the cities than in the rural area, which makes sense, higher density. But what they discovered was that if you were positive for 14 days, i.e. you really had the full disease, 89% uh, tested positive with antibody. But if you had a mild case, only half the people had antibodies. And they discovered that people who are younger, the people who are less than 25 years old, had less antibodies, which may be that they had a quick reaction there and then they didn't react. But that means that they don't have the full protection the next time they get re-exposed to it. Uh, so it brings us back to the super spreading event, um, which is that this concept more and more that in the U.S. having this high density event is what spread the virus. And that's probably what happened in Miami and Texas and some of this area there. And this is this concept of the dis dispersion factor called the K factor. And uh, Israel and, C and the CDC and Japan, all over the place, they're showing that it's really these cluster events that are driving the pandemic. It's not you walking in the street or taking your dogs on a walk. And uh, the World Health Organization finally recognized this week, it took a while, to, that 50% of the spread is due to pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic patients there. The other thing that you may have seen in the news, is, and we've been talking about this for, for weeks now, is that the microscopic droplet can stay in the air for up to three hours. So when they say the thing is contagious in the air, it's just because the droplet is staying in the air for a longer period of time. And if you remember, if you're in a dry environment where the humidity is less than 40%, the droplets are smaller, therefore they stay in the air longer. They also stay on surface longer. Uh, we're also discovering that the transmission is really unusual for, for, uh, for, uh, for an infection disease. It's upfront, it's front loaded. Most of the infection is before people uh, have any symptoms there. So again, I want to reemphasize the data is coming out from Peru and India and South Korea. I mean, I'll let you read this, that it is this super spreader events that spread the disease. And the ratio is 10% 10 10 of this massive event is what's driving this infection rate. So if we could control that, we could probably have a major impact in slowing down the spread of the disease. This is a study in Hong Kong where you had a, a wedding 
and you had this one person there, which was a staff member at the bar that was infected. And next thing we know, we had 106 cases. And these are just kind of this contact tracing, what they desperately need to do in the US is way behind in doing this. And Asia is doing a fantastic job and quickly isolating people. More importantly, learning how they got it and how they got it. So how we get all this data from, from Asia about, you know, what are the super events? Um, so uh, again, it's a reminder that uh, this, the virus stays on surface for a long period of time, but pretty much within one day, uh, unless it's stainless steels and some type of plastics there, you know, most, most of the virus does break down. Uh, this is in plastic there. You can see that roughly 98% of the virus is dissipated within 48 hours. So uh, it doesn't stay forever there, but, you know, just be aware. Uh, a, a new data came out of the World Health Forum, and, and what they show is that if you're in a high-density store, and let's say there's a 1,000 people with foot traffic there, and, and you have all these people passing you, you have a 15% risk of getting the disease, but if you have 3,600 people traffic, so like a big mall, uh, which is easy to do there, look at the percentage, 54%. If you go to a high, to a high density political rally there, where you have thousands of people there, you have very high probability of getting exposed. And I think that's what people need to understand: is the airflow, the density, uh, and the fact that people are packed on top of that. These are very, very high statistics. And so, again, I want to reassure people: if you are in a small amount of, of a group of, let's say, ten people there, these are pretty low probability there. Um, so, when to test and what to test. Uh, a reminder that when you get the viral load, you start getting the peak of the viral load roughly at day four after you've been exposed. But then pretty much if you want to do the PCR test, by day 10 or 12, it is nothing to measure. So when you do the PCR test, if you're negative, it's very important to understand if you test too early, which is before you have the symptoms, it may not be enough for the machine to recognize. And if you test too late, you don't have anything either. Um, and so it's, so it's really important that you understand when to do the testing. If you want to do the antibody, the peak is 21 days. That's the IgG there. And so, so if you gain about when you see the IgG, which is the one to measure there, if you do it too early there, you may not be able to detect it. So, so the type of testing you're doing and the timing of it, you need to really see when you think you got exposed and based on the symptoms that you got. Testing, a quick reminder there, there's two types of tests. There's a nasal swab, which I tried this week for the fun of it, and I was negative. Um, and uh, so they test your throat and then your two nostrils. And then the antibody test uh, is two types. One is the finger prick, and there's a lot of concern about the accuracy of this finger prick, what's called the fast tester. And then there's the one where they have to literally collect blood from your vein. That one is believed to be more accurate. So again, be careful what you're using. What we are discovering from China is that you have this huge explosion of the viral copy. You know, you go to 10 million viral RNA copies in that period of four to six days, and then it goes down. And then there's this little blip there we're discovering there that people a few months afterward they're still shedding the virus, and and so we and and there has been studies showing that uh, up to you know uh, people 60% of people may still be shedding the viral after 28 days. Now what we don't know is that are these dead cells. Uh, because you killed them, but it's still inside the lungs, or are they still contagious there? So we need to learn more about these blips, you know, and, and, and what's happening afterwards. So what we know for sure is the whole concept of the herd immunity is not working. Uh, Sweden tried to do that, and now they got to 7% uh, immunity there. Spain, I got hit really hard, got to 5%. Uh, I think the US, you know, the best is Manhattan, they got 15 to 20% but the rest of the country is probably around 4% there. In order to get herd immunity, because of how this virus is contagious at around a ratio of 2.5 to 3x on the RNO, is that we need 70 to 90% of the population to have antibodies. And that's clearly not gonna happen. So we need to or continue to use social distancing or get, buy enough time uh, to get a, virus, a vaccine to work. Uh, what's interesting is that we know the temperature is not reliable. So all these restaurants and, 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 and businesses were trying to open by checking a temperature is not a way to make sure that nobody is contagious. What seems to be much more effective is to do a smell test. And some people are coming up with this little scratcher. You may, you may, have, been to, may have been to a store where you scratch and you can smell like a perfume. So it's doing that, except you know exactly what's in there. And then, and then having people basically being tested to see if they can recognize the type of smell. And so I'm hoping that some people are working on that because 
uh, it's 27 times more accurate if you cannot smell than if you have a high temperature and it's only 2x accurate. So uh, uh, two, 2x, you know, predictive. So, um, and the other thing to be aware is that Color, which is a company here, tested 30,000 people and only 12% of the people were positive at a temperature over 100 degrees. And only 37% had the cough. So just relying on asking people, you have a cough and taking the temperature is not a way to know for sure that somebody is not contagious. So uh, if we look at the therapy, we try to repurpose existing drugs and we've discovered some drugs on the cortisoid uh, cortiso that works. We're looking at developing antibodies and vaccine. Uh, there's a lot of different vaccine and it's like five different types. You could take an existing virus, make it weaker or inactive. That's the traditional flu vaccine. Uh, we could basically take a piece of the coronavirus protein and try to create a, a response. You can see there's a lot of effort there. We could artificially create it, which is the DNA and RNA approaches. Uh, so there's five different approach and we need that because we need multiple shots on goals. Now to get a reality check, historically only 35% of the vaccine became successful. So good news, we have 145 vaccines or in clinical trials. Every time I talk to you, there's more of them. You can see a lot of them are already uh, in humans uh, and they're progressing very nicely there. And uh, you can see the progression of some of these, uh, uh, you know, the leading contender there. We still need to do thousands and thousands of phase three clinical trials and getting volunteers to be willing to be on the placebo group, on the control group, not knowing about it or receive uh, the vaccine. We don't know safety, efficacy, and, and we have never built a vaccine with this new mRNA platform. So we have a lot to learn. Uh, quick update. Um, uh, on the vaccine, Moderna has contracted with a company in Indiana to do 100 million doses by the, by the, the end of Q3. And that's doing this in parallel before we know if it works. Oxford and AstraZeneca, uh, which the UK has about 100 million doses and the US has about 300 million doses, is starting trials in South Africa. Uh, there is a, a attenuated form of the vaccine uh, that we think can really help um, a dampen the septic, that septic shock, uh, 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 cytokine storm inflammation there and using existing vaccines like MMR and polio. Uh, there's a lot of physicians pushing for that, but there has been no worldwide efforts that I know of. g, &G is starting their own testing in the US and Belgium. Uh, Sinovac in China is using an inactivated virus and they've had early results that shows that they neutralized the virus in 14 days on 90 people of the people after two injections. Pfizer and BioNTech are doing four vaccines in parallel in Germany there, and they've just announced they're going to build a billion doses by the end of next year. And uh, Innovio, which is an NIH and Gates, um, are developing a vaccine that we, you, you will use an electrical pulse to open the skin pores to push the vaccine uh, through the skin. A lot of these molecules are pretty big molecules. Uh, as you may know, in the US, the government has started this, what's called Operation Warp Speed, and they have uh, picked five vaccines that they're making beds on, and they are developing contracts with all these vaccines at really a very high commitment in the billions of dollars. And these are AstraZeneca and Oxford, which they're splitting with the UK. j and uh, &J, uh, in the test that I just mentioned earlier, uh, and the Moderna and the BioNTech and Pfizer and Merck. So uh, there's a very big concern on nationalism. And, and the concept is that we ultimately need to vaccinate 7 billion people, and which is something that has never been done before. And th the concern is that the US is buying all the capacity of some of these early vaccine and may not allow to give access to uh, 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 other countries. Uh, the UK just announced today that they left the collaborative effort in the EU uh, to just focus on the deal they made with Oxford and AstraZeneca. And of course, there's a big disappointment in the EU about that. The US, as you know, has made big bets. They just announced uh, a few days ago uh, a $1.6 billion purchase of 100 million doses, which is roughly 50 million people. And that's only for the high-risk healthcare workers. It's not for the rest of the population. Uh, the BARDA has made a deal of $1.2 billion for AstraZeneca. Uh, to, to share some of that with the UK, and we'll get 300 million doses by the end of the year. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the DOD is supposed to be in charge of distributing the drugs, which we'll see how that works. Uh, 
Uh, in Europe, there's this big effort. Uh, it's organized by CP, which is a coalition for epidemic preparedness. And the idea there is that the Gates Foundation, the EU, Novartis, and Wellcome Trust are working with the European government to really invest uh, up to $30 billion, which is a massive numbers there, to build this capacity with the idea behind a rich country like Germany and France will pay for the vaccine and then subsidize the vaccine for poorer countries because we need to uh, share, share the vaccine, not just inside a border because clearly the virus has shown it can go across borders, uh, but you know really spread this vaccine and protect uh, several populations. On the therapeutic side, just as a reminder, the big problem we have is this spike that attached to that ACE2 receptor. You can see that roughly half of the efforts is blocking that ACE2 receptor. And then the rest of it is to, after it gets inside the cell is to, is to stop the proliferation of the virus inside the cell. So uh, quick reminder, we go for the viral load and then we have the T cell. So if you get into that period where you get sick, we try to load people with antivirals to stop the proliferation of the virus. We also do injection of uh, immune booster uh, drugs to help you, the defense system. If you unfortunately lose control uh, of the disease, then we start going into protecting the vital organ with anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, vasodilators. So the good news we've really learned since New York uh, and we have a lower mortality rate. The bad news is that there has been no federal coordination of those trials. And, and there has been 1,200 trials pretty much testing everything we can think of. And the problem with this is that, you know, enrolling volunteers of people who are sick with the disease is, for example, with hydroxychloroquine, 35% of all the volunteers were just dedicated to doing, I don't know how many tests of hydroxychloroquine. It was a huge amount of studies there. And, and so 39% of the other tests were too small when they had less than 100 people there. So whatever the outcome is, you cannot really you know, know if it's really scalable. And the UK just put $2.5 million in a study there where they had a very simple uh, outcome. Are you alive or you're dead? And they are the one who came up with two drugs that are existing drugs that work. And one of them is dexamethasone. And, and so dexamethasone, uh, is very effective. And what they've shown is that if somebody is in the hospitals on oxygen, but not intubated, so it's the same population that Redemsevir, that they're having a 34% lower mortality for people on the ventilators and 20% lower mortality if you're just on oxygen therapy. Um, and they also discovered that uh, uh, lenzilumab is a cheaper drugs that Redemsevir. It also decreased that cytokine storm from 10 days to five days. So that's a small study from the Mayo Clinic that needs to be uh, duplicated. And of course, you all know about Redemsevir from Gilead, which they just priced at around $3,000 there. And that also, again, is working on people who are not intubated and give you a 32% faster recovery. So it's a small segment of the population. It's not for people who are not hospitalized. It's just in case you're in the hospital there. Hydroxychloroquine, this is the story that doesn't stop. Uh, as you know, there has been multiple study uh, initially from France showing that you know, it may work, and then multiple studies showing that not only does not work, but it doubles the mortality. And then uh, Henry Ford just came out on July the 2nd before the holidays showing that if you give it within 48 hours of admission to the hospital, uh, it has uh, an impact in decreasing the mortality rate. But look at the numbers. Uh, the mortality rate of the control group is 26% of everybody that's in the hospital there. And if you're on hydroxy, it's 22%, so it's a bit of a drop. And with hydroxy and azithromycin, it's 20%. So this is clearly not a cure for death. And so, the, so it's still out there, more study to come up. Uh, but just be aware, I mean, I would not take hydroxychloroquine unless you, know, you have a doctor uh, involved in this decision. And all the drugs on HIV have failed. So clearly that mechanism is not working. A new drug has arrived called RV-mectin, and you may have heard that this is a drug that's being used for parasitic infection like head lice. Most of them are being used uh, on animals. And in vitro, which is in a petri dish, they've shown that they can decrease by 5,000 times the replication of COVID. They can decrease the, uh, the duplication uh, of COVID. That's a big deal. Uh, the FDA has issued a letter saying this is intended for animals and should not be used on humans and that the type, the amount of the drug that you have to give will be potential toxic uh, into human. Meanwhile, there has been several articles that have come out, including a test done in South Florida, showing that it does have an impact and that 
the mortality was significantly lower. So if you look at se severe pulmonary disease, i.e. somebody on a ventilator, it jumped from 80% mortality, this is Florida, uh, to 38%, so that's roughly half. So these are big deals. So I think that you're going to see more data. Uh, most of the trials are outside the US and Bangladesh is some good observatory story. There's a trial in Israel and Dominican Republic and has used on 1300 mild patients there. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll get more data in the coming weeks on this. Russia just announced this week that they approved a drug called Cornavir, and uh, that they've shown that is a 55% improvement for outpatient. It's the first time we hear about a drug that can be used outside the hospital. All the other drugs I mentioned were being used inside the hospital there. Uh, so that's hopefully uh, continue to be validated. And they showed that after five days, 77% of the patient had no virus. Again, that's the first time we've seen this. Uh, antibody therapy, uh, there's several monoclonal, anti uh, monoclonal anti antibody therapy that's coming out. These are very expensive. They are by injections. Uh, Regeneron is in the phase three trials. They're doing 2,000 patients after people have been exposed in 150 sites uh, in US, Brazil, Mexico, and Chile. Uh, Eli Lilly is doing a phase one called the tri Lucky Triple Five. Somebody had some humor. And Canada is having a uh, collaboration with Absalera. And Eli Lilly is also starting to do quantity. So, so uh, the, the antibody therapy is something, again, you're going to be used if you're hospitalized because it's very expensive. Let's talk about the economy. Uh, we initially found we were going to get a quick recovery. Now it's more and more estimated that we're going to get a really slow recovery because we have this acceleration of the virus. And that may cost us $5 trillion in GDP loss. Uh, so ironically, whoops, uh, opening up too early uh, may have cost us a bigger problem. We also look at the fact that if you look at the hotspot area there, you can really see that the use of credit card, which shows you people going retailing and shopping there, went up much faster and earlier uh, than the other states. A study from McKinsey just came out this week, which is quite interesting. And it shows the impact on small businesses and how much time it will take to recover. And you can see that clearly the art, entertainment, and recreation industry is expected, you know, is really going to take a hit all the way to 2024 and 2025, just because uh, the virus may be here for a while. Same thing for the uh, uh, retail and food services and educational services. So you can see that it is expected that the small businesses are going to get hit really, really hard uh, uh, by, by the restructuring of the industry. Uh, and as a result of that, it's expected that the losses from the disruption from the virus over the next 10 years will cost roughly half of the EBITDA, which is the earnings of, of this large company there over that time period. So this is a massive impact. And you can see the gas industry took a big hit, as well as aerospace, the, you know, the airline industry, car industry. So, but this is a significant number. Uh, the government of all the countries have responded to it as an idea. This is comparing the intervention to the 2008 financial crisis. Germany has been the most aggressive. They are like a factor of 9x in the fiscal stimulus compared to the US, which is around 2.4x. So I want to give you the, the fact that the Europeans have been much more aggressive as well as Japan in trying to keep their economy going. And then the last slide uh, is that uh, McKinsey came up with the fact that as people are working remotely, companies are discovering that we could do business much better. And one of the things is to make decisions faster uh, and, the, and decrease all these meetings that goes on forever and get rid of 50% of these meeting and reports that don't get anybody to make decisions. Uh, they also have discovered that I mean, people, this remote monitoring there with once in a while in-person meeting is pretty effective. And a certain type of industry, especially the white collar industry, it's, it's, it's expected that maybe up to 70% of the workforce may be re, uh, working remotely several times, uh, several days a week. Um, uh, people also expect to flatten the organization curve. All these ideas that you need to have this meeting of small people there to pass the information there, we're discovering that using Zoom, you don't need all this layer of organization. So people expect restructuring of industry. Uh, getting this, you know, sweat team, uh, a group of five or six people there to tackle a, a problem there instead of very large uh, structure. And it is, therefore, this is going to get an impact on the type of people we hire and how we're going to retain them. So, so there's an expectation that this is fundamentally going to have an impact in how we hire, how we manage, uh, uh, you know, small to large organizations. So we, we keep an eye on that. So uh, thank you uh, for your patience. I know this was a long update. 
uh, please uh, go on YouTube on my and insights. Please share it uh, to your friends. You know, I'm trying to spread the network, the, the the knowledge there, so we can influence the behavior of people, especially the people between 20 to 50 years old. And and give me a thumbs up. Thank you very much.